Welcome to this conversation. In this conversation, I want to talk about the moon's placement in Gemini. And uh, if you've enjoyed my moon in sign placement series, uh, you know, different podcasts I've given, you may also enjoy this one because uh, the last podcast was talking about the moon in Cancer. So today we're going to take a step further back and talk about the moon's placement in the sign of Gemini. The sign of Gemini is what comes before the sign of Cancer. So we're uh, going back in the evolutionary process. So we're going to devolve and take one step further back from the intelligence that is the sign of Cancer. And members of my classes, my training classes, will have come to understand that the 12 segmented zodiac, it, they're basically intelligences and they evolve from one into another. So Aries is what becomes Taurus. And Taurus is what becomes Gemini, and Gemini is what becomes Cancer. And there is a constant stream of an intelligence that is evolving. And what that intelligence is evolving is a sense of self, a much deeper representation for the sense of self. Because the challenge really of being human is being intelligent. That intelligence is self-consciousness. It's not an intelligence of physics, of chemistry, and all, because all these discourses, they come from delineating the nature of self-consciousness. I know a lot of scientists out there like to feel that they are studying some type of objective universe that exists outside of themselves, but they can never prove this, and there's a reason for that. You can only experience the world from inside your head. So it doesn't matter what you think about the objective nature of reality. You can never prove that such a thing exists, and you can never know what it is like. Because you as a living sentient being are only ever privy to one vantage point, And that is what it feels like to be you. So that when you come to understand anything, what you're really doing is that you have understood an aspect of yourself. This is extremely important. Most people tend to forget this as they chase this rabbit down the hole. They think that some type of intelligence is the study of some type of objective reality that is out there and separate from the self. Well, if such a thing exists, you'll never know about it. What we describe as human reality on this physical earth is the process of extending the self into various aspects of reality so that you become the science that you study. You become the people that you observe. You become all the interactions that you engage in. That is the nature of what it means to be self-aware on earth because it is that which is an extension of your sense of self. Now, the important thing to note about this sense of self is that what exactly is it? And my podcast on Sun Conjunct Pluto goes into great detail, explaining what the sense of self is, where it comes from, and the necessity for its arisal, meaning that it is a story, a narrative that is conjured up, basically, all right, as a way of recognizing what this sentience really is. It's a reference point, because without that reference point, beingness, sentient beingness cannot be established. And beingness, that sentient beingness, is the fulcrum, the datum, from where you extend filaments into different areas that you now call discourses. So that when you're studying something like physics, and you get to a point, or even mathematics, and you get to a point where things are not clear, you do not understand how the narrative goes. I mean, what, you know, you're reading a text on mathematics, advanced mathematics, for instance, and you no longer can see how this discourse is supposed to move forward. And there is no discourse. It's that within yourself, right? Because what you're studying is a narrative. You know, whether it's mathematics or physics or whatever, it's a narrative. It's a story. You can no longer see how that story goes from point A to point B. And that means that there is a connection in that narrative that is missing. Meaning that it's not missing in the text. It's missing within you because you, as you define yourself, cannot match the dynamic that is inherent in that narrative that you're studying. So that the connections that are in the narrative, and these connections proceed by method of proof, especially when it comes to mathematics, right? The proof are a sequence of logical deductions and inferences, right? Now, you can no longer find those connections within yourself, and then it leads to a lack of understanding. You don't know how to proceed anymore. And you can understand this thinking to all other areas of discourse. Doesn't matter what it is, it could be languages. Learning a foreign language, each language is a narrative. It has its own internal structure and consistency. That's what makes it a language, right? 
So it's no different from mathematics. It's no different from astrology. It's a language, right? And these languages have symbols and the symbols have meaning. They have representation also. And that way people are able to reproduce the structure of this language as part of their self-consciousness. So that the language is not separate from you, really. It is you. The physics isn't separate from you. It is you. So that when you are looking for how to extend the frontiers of that physics or the frontiers of that mathematics into new realms of understanding, what you're really trying to do is to extend aspects of yourself into new areas. It's like trying to open up new doors in your consciousness based on the narrative that you are telling yourself. And when you cannot do this, it means you cannot find those doors. So it doesn't matter what the discourse is. The bottom line is that the connection is missing. First of all, you have to know what that connection is supposed to be like and then to look for it and find it within yourself. Now, if you've been paying attention to the five principles of organized complexity, you would have come to the conclusion that or you would have come to the realization of my message that the connections themselves, right, are the connections that are responsible for the distribution of prime numbers. It doesn't matter what you believe and that's the most important thing because this has nothing to do with belief. It is the way that your consciousness is built whether you are aware of it or not. Those distributions, that the entire distribution itself, right, is a three-dimensional structure. And within that three-dimensional structure, you have these very beautiful sixes that connect every aspect of it. And their function is to make sure that the prime numbers are as equidistributed as possible. And so what that leads to is a synchronization, an infinite synchronization between every placement of prime number till infinity. Now, Depends on how good your imagination is. You can decide to imagine this type of structure by yourself. Okay? But that's what it is. Those are what underlie the connections themselves. So it doesn't matter whether the connections are in physics. It doesn't matter whether the connections are in languages. It doesn't matter whether the connections are in mathematics. It doesn't matter whether the connections are in humanities or whatever. All right? If they are true, then they must correspond to these sixes. And that is the basis of all types of artificial intelligent constructions that you can imagine. They're not really, I mean, to be honest, I don't see how you can actually create some type of intelligent system without following this logic. Although they try to disguise it in many ways, they would. <laughs> if I tell you what these so-called academic people have been up to, you wouldn't believe it. You'd think it's a conspiracy theory. I'm almost at the very verge of confirming that the whole of academia, especially at the highest level, is a fraud, just based on theft. I'm just about coming to that conclusion from based on what I have seen so far and the evidence I've been able to gather. Now, back to the lecture at hand. The connections themselves, right? What do they really do? Because now you can replace prime numbers. You can replace them by something else. That is the nature of concept. All right. Now, what is concept? Concept is a landing point for intelligence because, for instance, the most basic type of concepts are numbers. That's really what it is. The number one is a concept that has representation. Then you can scribble it in whatever form that you want. But what it means, what it what underlies its understanding is based is very basic. It's a relationship that really doesn't go anywhere. It's a reference, not even to self. It's an assumption on the nature and unitary behavior of self. It is an intrinsic understanding of self without reference to anything. Okay? Now, when self makes a reference to itself, maybe if by virtue of looking in a mirror or by virtue of considering a type of reflection of itself, then that leads to the number two. And when this self-reflectivity makes reference to the original intrinsic understanding of self, then that's the number three. And once you have one, two, three, you have an infinity of numbers that are possible. So that these numbers, they represent the earliest concepts that can be formed. So they represent what? The relationship between things. So that one doesn't really have any meaning except you have it in reference to something else. Two or three or any other thing. So numbers are representational constructs that help us to understand the relationship between things. And it is this which is at the basis of what we currently call self-consciousness now this is irrespective of whether you believe in these things or not it doesn't matter what you believe really all right at the root of your being this is the narrative that you are telling yourself if you didn't tell yourself this narrative you could not exist all right and the sixes are the things now that allow your consciousness to pack itself as densely as is physically possible
And when that happens, it shows up as blackness in physical reality. And that's why your entire central nervous system, your nervous system as a whole, including your immune response, is all driven by blackness. Without it, you could not be. Take this to any scientist at the forefront of thinking in neuroscience or whatever. Tell them that I said so. Tell them to refute me. Tell them to discredit me if they can. All right. Now, the nature of these concepts and the way that they connect together, that is what forms the essence of Gemini. That's really what it is. The Geminian psychological archetype, right, is the first staring of the nature of intelligence. That is a mental type of intelligence, an intelligence that is driven by some type of narrative or voice. Because you can repeat what I'm saying in your mind. Which voice is it that's really telling that story in your mind? You can repeat statements to yourself without ever making a sound. How is that possible? You can visualize your living room around you, whatever it is, if you close your eyes. Which eyes are you using to visualize that in your head? You can recall the type of smell that you perceived yesterday. What is doing the recalling? It's a narrative. And that narrative is the evidence that there is something about you that is very different from the way every other creature behaves on this planet. Because you can change that narrative in your head. You can change the color of what you see in your head. You can imagine realities that haven't occurred yet. Well, some animals can do that to at least to a certain extent, but they have no reference point for all of that, meaning that they do not perceive the nature of a self that is reflective. Because if they can do that, they can change the nature of what they are. A goat can decide that it no longer wants to be a goat. And you will know this from the behavior. The first place where that begins to occur is what we call Gemini. That's really what it is. It's a type of narrative that begins to take place very early in the young infant. And there's a stage at which this becomes possible. Prior to that, the infant doesn't know anything. It doesn't know any type of separation between itself and its environment. It believes that it is its environment. But at some point in time, a series of activities begin to lead to this separation. And it's only when you get into my classes, you know, you can now understand all of this from the astrological point of view. Okay, because what is astrology? That thing which we call as astrology is such a bastardized name for this thing. That's why I tend to call it psychodynamics. I tend to call it the behavior of complexly evolving ensembles. And the reason is because astrology is such a bastardized name. And this was done deliberately by putting astrology as part of the comedy section in the daily papers. You know, there, is, there was a lot of effort to discredit astrology because people needed to construct what you call modern day science today because of the inherent profitability involved in that pursuit. Not because it leads to truth. Science will never give you truth. It will never tell you the answers to the big questions. Who you are, where you came from, you know, where you are going, what human life is supposed to be, what you're supposed to be doing on this planet what the nature of truth is, it will never tell you anything like that because it wasn't designed to answer those types of questions. The modern day science enterprise as pursued by largely academic field is designed to always lead to more questions that require more experimentation, which requires more funding, which provides more jobs and more careers. That's really what it is. It's not the search for anything. And as a result, its entire structure is to get more bloated more and more bloated because there's something called there's something about the nature of complexity complexity is very easy to generate all you need to do is just keep exploding the nature of things and you keep going deeper and deeper and deeper and it never ends it just the trajectories for questions just multiply infinitely often until the whole thing explodes and you no longer see how it goes the real important thing is simplicity because our minds are really able to gather a tremendous amount of detail and sift through all of that and present it as one simplified reality which we now call ourselves. For that to occur, we use the most complex structure imaginable and that's our brain so that it takes a great level of complexity that is inherent within our heads. It's, that's why I call it organized complexity to create the simplified version of reality. Otherwise, we couldn't function if you had to detail every smell, had to detail every sight, had to work out the logic of everything over and over again. 
nothing could function. So that you see that the complexity of brain is designed as an attempt to simplify reality by latching onto the commonalities of concepts and linking all of them together so that you can create the simplification. That's what the sixes do. And that's what blackness does in your nervous system. When this begins to malfunction, like I've told you, all neurodegenerative diseases from Alzheimer's to Parkinson's are linked to the breakdown of this function. All right? That's really what it is. That is the essence of Gemini. It is the connection between these concepts. Now, the essence at the stage of Gemini isn't really in the overall logical structure. No, its pleasure just comes from these connections discovering these connections so it can link one thing to another and link another thing to another and because of that it is not moralized because its basic function is just to establish the connections now whether the connections are hurtful whether they're sad whether they're happy it is not interested in all it's really concerned with at this stage is to make the connections because the connections form the foundation upon which the psychological representation of the human being will be established so that you, before you get to the foundation of cancer, because when what happens is that in the sign of cancer, all of these connections are now internally represented as memory. So that they form the most basic levels of memory. And what does that mean? The most basic level of memory is what you have in your genome. It's what you transfer to your offspring. And I have podcasts where I explain how this occurs. Okay? It's an internal memory system. But the memory needs to be generated from something. So that the entire sign of Gemini is concerned with object recognition, because that's what Gemini is really geared up to perform. Linking these concepts is recognizing these concepts. First of all, you have to establish the nature of a concept, all right? And then you have to link it up together. It is only when you get to Virgo that the concepts link up to form some type of logical structure that you can now examine. Now, what is it that is changing? I've just told you the change that occurs between Gemini and the sign of Cancer. All right. The same thing is what is transforming all the signs until you get to Pisces. It is the transfiguration of intelligence. And that intelligence is the nature of your self-consciousness. That's really what it is. Good. Now, let's go into the moon because we've talked about the moon so extensively. I'm not going to repeat all the details. The moon is basically concerned with self-acceptance. But what is the nature of self-acceptance within the context of this Geminian function? All right. Because I've told you the Geminian function is the acquisition of these concepts and then the linking of these concepts together. Now, we've already talked about how the moon is a predictable type of change, because eventually, that predictability, which is a clocking function, which is a calendar type of function, a time-measuring function, right? That is going to form the basis upon which the psychological edifice will rest, because it will form the core of your convictions. That's really what it is. All right? So that's the essence of the moon. The moon is always looking to perform these predictable changes in such a way that they can become the psychological foundation so that they are predictable. And predictability means that you know where everything is and you know what everything means. Now, when the moon finds itself in an environment that where it is capable of doing this and linking all of this predictable change in such ways that everything becomes very known and very familiar, then the moon gives you the gift of self-acceptance. What it translates to really is that you know exactly who you are. Nothing else can sway you anymore. And that is the basis of psychological foundation in a human. You know precisely who you are. There's no ambiguity there anymore. And based on that foundation, you can act and project yourself into the world. Now, if you don't know who you are, then you're going to be second guessing yourself at every interval and you can be swayed by everything that crosses your path because you have no basis, really, no foundation. So what the moon is always trying to do, wherever it is located, especially anywhere that the sign of cancer, is that it is always trying to generate this concept of self-acceptance, this psychological function or foundation of self-acceptance. So when the moon finds itself in Gemini, it starts to investigate these concepts and their linkages for the nature of this self-acceptance. And that's where we have a problem. Because the Geminian function does not form these self-acceptances it doesn't. It forms linkages between concepts. It doesn't know what self-acceptance is because that is something that occurs much later down the evolutionary line in the sign of cancer. In Gemini, there is no compulsion that these predictable changes must land on things that generate self-acceptance. So that it's like looking for something before it is lost. 
So how are you going to find it? And so the moon in Gemini, because of this condition, translates into a wandering search. A search that is constantly looking for stability, for the base of psychological foundation. It's constantly searching for it in Gemini. And that means that it begins to treat the connection between these concepts with a bias. So rather than the Geminian function of randomly just trying to connect different concepts all over the place, all right? Because that's what Gemini does. And Gemini, when it does this, it doesn't really have any consideration for the emotions generated by the linking of these concepts. It doesn't know. It doesn't care. It's, it's not able to anticipate that at this point in the evolutionary sequence. So when the moon comes into Gemini, it tries to force this behavior on the Geminian archetype. And the result it simply becomes a search for a matching process. That is, a search for reconciliation. And of course, this doesn't happen. So when you find this in the natal chart, it's to generate a sort of eternal dynamism of the mind. So that the mind begins to wander constantly. But it's not wandering aimlessly. It's trying to match a particular function because it's trying to derive the concept of self-acceptance from what is largely an intellectual pursuit. And so people who display this type of thing, they have trouble concentrating on anything really. Now, the things that really get their attention are the things that look like they can be able to form this psychological foundation that they're looking for. And so they veer off in that direction, but they never find it. Because that psychological foundation really is not an intellectual pursuit. It's an emotional one. Because it is the internalization of these intellectual things, right? Into the region where they are now given some sensitivity. They're connected to the emotions. All right, that's really what it is. So from this, you can begin to derive all the behavioral prescriptions for the moon in Gemini. All right, because now you have a predictable system of change, right? Now searching within something that appears very random. And what it's trying to do is it is looking for synchronicity. It's trying to pattern that space into something that contains a very high level of intelligence. Because we all recognize the difference in order and chaos. It's trying to bring order to chaos and that is what it perceives as its worldview people like this when they're feeling very sensitive and emotional they try to understand their reality they try to put everything in its logical place but they're not doing it with the mercurial intellect basically they're doing it with their feelings and it makes it very difficult to control such a system so what you have is a very high level of inefficiency so they display the intellectual wit and propensity of Gemini. But when it comes to actually using it tangibly in the world, they falter because they simply cannot concentrate on what needs to be done, where and when. Everything is always jumbled up. Everything is always here and there. So it appears as if they're chasing the rabbit down the rabbit hole almost infinitely. Meaning there seems to be no end to it. And so the only way that these people are able to comfort themselves is when they are able to find a corresponding area that allows them to use and train their emotions with their intellect. And so Moon in Gemini placement is an invitation towards the best of both worlds. And usually it is an important statement in the natal chart because it always corresponds with the placement of Mercury. There's always a story there. And it goes on and on into the natal chart. These are narratives that are placed within a natal chart because they're involved in something else. And usually, the story always involves a connection to the life task, which is represented by where you find the Saturnian placement. So that in the natal chart, you are given some armory and then you are given a deficiency. And the entire point is that there's a relationship between what you're given and what is denied you. And the idea is to use what you are given to construct that which you are denied so that you can complete the 12 segments of the zodiac and balance out your mind. Because it is only when your mind is balanced out that you can see the reality for what it really is. Because you can see yourself for what you really are. And that is the gift of sentient life. That's, what, that's the gift of intelligence. Because once you understand who you are, what you are, you know, then every other question is answered. What else? I've told you all the questions are derivatives from you, from the sense of self that you feel. All the questions, it doesn't matter what they are. They can be in advanced level physics. You are not deconstructing a reality out there. You're deconstructing yourself. So if you don't know the nature of self, then you cannot answer any question out there. You can't even know that any question is true. You can't even know that any question has an answer that is true. The truth of any question is not out there. It is who you are. And this is the gift of moon in Gemini. 
Now, one of the difficulties, like I've said, the moon is found in Gemini. So that the moon's normal sensitive nature is looking for a resting place within the mind. And it cannot really find that. How this shows up in the personality is someone who understands the nature of sensitivity and empathy, understands the nature of what it means to feel, but they do not understand it as something that they have felt. They only understand it as something that they can think of. So they can empathize, they can sympathize, they can be sensitive, but it all only ever remains an intellectual pursuit so that they don't really know what it means as part of their psychological foundation. They have no idea what those things are. So they can give the impression of being these things without ever being able to connect with those things per se. And the result is a dissonance. And it's one of the reasons why they end up being very restless and very irritable and very agitated. Because they know what these things are, but they only know it from a point of view of Gemini. But the moon cannot be satisfied by Gemini because Gemini is not as intelligent as the sign of cancer. Okay? Because from every stage, from Aries all the way to Pisces, something evolves, something is added. The progression of the sign is the fact that something is changing. It is becoming more conscious. And that means that aspects of the self are being unlocked. In Aries, for instance, the self that is being unlocked is extremely small. They, you know, Aries doesn't really have insight into the rest of the zodiac. It is mainly concerned with being alive. And that is its primary purpose. It envelops its worldview. Like I told you, I said, look, your dog that you have in your house or your cat, it doesn't matter what you call it right? It doesn't know that that's its name. It simply knows that when it hears this sound, it's supposed to respond because good things come from that. You are usually referring to it, but it doesn't know what that name is. Worse, it doesn't know what it is. Even worse, it never asks itself what it is. It doesn't contemplate because what does that even mean? You realize how strange it is for a creature to contemplate its own existence. Such a recursion is what makes our brain very complex. The fact that it needs to engage in these recursions because it is from that recursion that every intelligence that we have comes from. That's really what it is. So that the moon in Gemini lives in this intellectual world of these randomized connections. Always trying to look for what is fact and what is not fact and trying to use that to comfort the self. But you see, life is more complicated than the rational mind. Life is more complicated than the need to make rational arguments. Eventually, our gut is more intelligent than that aspect of the mind that rationalizes. That's why the sign of cancer comes after the sign of Gemini. It's not all about the rational mind. It's important how we feel because that feeling process, right, really is an aggregation of all that rationality to create simplification, which is what allows us to function in the world. We don't function based on detailed concepts. If we did that, we wouldn't know the meaning of anything, really. We'd spend too much time trying to recognize and figure out everything all the time. But that simplification also comes with additional costs and risks because it is responsible for all the disagreements that we have. So when you look at scientists trying to build artificial intelligence, they're not really concerned with this heuristic building process. They're concerned with channeling all the details because you want your robot or whatever it is to be accurate all the time. And when people talk about AI surpassing human intelligence, that's what they mean because a machine like that cannot forget. But we forget that as human beings, Forgetting is an essential part of the memory process. If we couldn't forget, we couldn't function. But the forgetting itself is also another construct because we never really forget anything. If we did, our brains wouldn't have to be this complex. We only ever imagine forgetfulness as part of our own programming for internalization. So that the moon in Gemini really is concerned with that forgetfulness. Which is what makes it appear almost unreliable when you find it as a personality trait. All right? People who seem to say one thing and then do another. They just, you know, they, they flit from one thing to another. And people wonder, how is this person so unreliable? How are they so inconsistent? Well, they're not. They're trying to be consistent, but this is the way in which they are being consistent. All right? They cannot be like anybody else because if they try that, they'll probably go insane. 
So their way of managing their own experience, especially as this placement comes into their reality, right, is to be inconsistent, to flit from one thing to another in the hope that when you aggregate all of it, then somehow it all makes sense. So they make it up as they go along, basically. All right? And if you could feel what it was like to be them, you wouldn't criticize them on that. It's the only way they can be, really. Now, when people begin to criticize them, then they move into a defensive mode. And you know what the defense for this type of combination really is? Lying. Trickery. Treachery. Because what else do you expect? It's Gemini. And you think it really cares about the connections, the, the links it is forging between these concepts? No. Its superpower is being able to forge these links randomly and, you know, all over the place. And so it doesn't intend to deceive you and lie. It's not a Neptunian influence, really. It just finds out that that's what occurs when it is put on the spot. Its mind immediately finds another connection through the chaos and out comes a reality system that it gives to you. And then he goes somewhere else and does the same thing to someone else. And then he goes to another place and does the same thing to someone else. And before you know what's happening, it's created a right model. And it's at the center of that model. You know, like a, a spider that doesn't know how to really form a web. Because these alternate realities, right? There's nothing really linking them. And so they tend to have the reputation of being a fibs, you know, people who don't tell the truth. <laughs> now, the change begins to occur when they begin to become aware of this process. Because this occurs when they are put on the spot and they don't have to be on the spot. They're not like you. So trying to be like you is what gets them in trouble. Eventually, they learn to be like themselves and to understand their own process. And that usually is the reason for this placement. Because that understanding, that awareness is usually needed in the area where they are denied, which is where you find that Saturn and the natal chart. Where you now need to use this as an aptitude to construct the reality in that area. That's usually what it is. Otherwise, they're excellent storytellers. You wouldn't want better company when it comes to chatting and, you know, and social talk and all of that things. They have a repertoire of facts running around in their heads because it's Gemini, in it? That's really what it is. Okay? And so they find that camaraderie amongst people who understand them, who can live in the type of world that they do. They understand that, that they're little children, really, at heart. They are. They're, you know, the mythology of, of Gemini is the same mythology of Hermes, of, of you know, like a trickster. But it's not really a trickster. It's more like a mischievous, you know, always looking to have fun, always looking to play games. Because they're children really at heart. That's the point I'm trying to make. Okay? It's just that the whole world tends to want to take them too seriously. But when we come to understand their process and they understand their process, then they really stop trying to be like everybody else. And they can now begin to use their gift because that gift is a superpower. They have the potential to be literary geniuses. That's really what it is.